And so it really is my great pleasure. And I do this with a kind of interesting sense of trepidation, actually, um, that I have to step this evening in the border country between practitioner and professor. Yeah. So um, I definitely feel like I'm standing in slightly different shoes to those of you, and I'm sorry for that, that have seen me present in my day job uh, on many occasions. So culture and cities, the cultural sector and placemaking. It's a well-worn path, and in many ways it's been central to my professional life for a quarter of a century now, a little bit more actually, scary. Um, and yet it remains abstracted and elusive to me. I really wanted to spend our time this evening sharing some thoughts on that elusive interaction between two things, cultures and city, cities. And behind that is my sense that there is still actually a genius that needs to be fully unlocked and explored. I'll share some of my reflections on where I think cultural policy narrative is at the moment, and some of my thoughts on why cities continue to be the human race's most potent creative space and arguably that cities themselves are our most profound and baffling invention. As I was thinking about all of this in these new shoes, um, I needed to go back to some contestable first principles in my own thinking. You know how you habituate stuff? You kind of go, do I really think that, actually? Um, so let me throw these out there. Um, uh, and now, and let me throw these out there now, and you can sit and contest them as I explore them. Um, I find that every day I cannot get away from the idea that creativity or art or culture, whichever phrase we like, are a fundamental precept of what it is to be a human being. Uh, I know we can all be actually quite coy and skittish about that, but bear with me, because if we make it part of our narrative, in the same way that we understand ourselves as human beings because of our thumbs or because of standing upright, then it seems to me that we immediately democratise culture uh, and make it something for everyone and not something for those in the know and not just something that is the domain of the artist. Um, this is an entirely different argument to one that I have to say fatigues me. And I realised after I'd written this, I, I'm, I point out a couple of times where I get fatigued by my own sector. Right, so this is the first one. Yeah. The notion of good and bad culture, or that one kind of culture deserves more support than another. So luckily, I'm not fully going to explore that this evening, but allow me to start from a gentle place that in broad terms, creativity, art and culture in more places involving more people is a force for good. And remember that genius that I mentioned earlier that we're trying to unlock? So against that little introduction, what's really my scope for this evening? I think it's that I want to explore, through sharing my learnt experience, the interaction between the way that the circumstances of public policy and practical action interact in the wider context of city making we might sometimes call that urban policy making. And that policy making uh, and the activity of the cultural sector uh, have a dynamic relationship with it. I'm going to do that with mostly within the context of the UK. Um, as Ian mentioned, I did manage to spend four great years in Melbourne, Australia, another great city. Um, and I'll hint at that with a few other international examples. Um, because I think actually all of us carry a little bit of international perspective in us these days, uh, not least in all of those weekend visits that all of you have made to other cities for cultural experiences. So um, let me cover off this point with you as well. In our practical and pragmatic working lives, our only sensible choice is to address positively the circumstances as we find them. Uh, for example, in my current role as Chief Exec of Culture Central in this city, Birmingham. But I'm actually not directly going to speak about that this evening. Um, therefore, I felt I needed to understand a little more of a couple of other drivers for this. And I use a few words of my own and then behind, hide behind, then I'll hide behind a few words of John Berger. Um, I think there is plenty of room to chew around this idea of culture and cities. It's a great 
word from my time in Yorkshire to chew something around. Yeah. I always liked that, you know. Um, and, but is it, but the, the fundamental question underneath it is who really makes a city? Who really makes a city? Um, and is it really the world of policy and politicians and the public sector rules of planning and development? Or is it the business sector? Or is it Zuckerberg? Or is it coffee shop chains? Or is it the conversation that you do or don't have on the street corners with your neighbours? Does public policy lead or follow this dilemma? And more robustly, Berger wrote in one of his final essays with the wonderful bluntness that old age uh, liberates and permits. So this is his quote. In the totalitarian global order of financial speculative capitalism under which we are living, the media ceaselessly bombard us with information. Yet the information is mostly planned diversion, distracting our attention from what is true, essential and urgent. Politicians of both left and right continue to debate, to vote, to pass resolutions as if this were not the case. And as a result, their discourse refers to nothing and is inconsequential. The words and terms they use repeatedly, such as terrorism, democracy, flexibility, have been emptied of meaning. Now, why do I use Burgess' words in this context? Uh, other than because they're fabulous, of course. Because culture, art, was always his touchstone. And that phrase in there, what is true, essential and urgent, we might reflect is the only cultural policy that any city needs. So if I've dipped my toe in the slightly dangerous water of cultural democracy now, anybody picked up that term? We're using that a lot in cultural policy worlds at the moment. I'd like to do the same for cities for a moment. And here are some compelling stats. Less than 2% of the Earth's surface is occupied by urban areas, but they accommodate currently 50% of the world's population, and in most of our lifetimes that'll rise to more like three quarters, 75%. But they also account for 70% already of the world's GDP. So um, there's something going on with what it is to be a human being and the development of cities at this moment um, in our world. So if you look across uh, much of the brilliant writing about cities, you might come across a state statement like this. Their size and economic complexity means that city-specific problems such as congestion, waste, education and crime require considered city-specific public intervention. And at the same time, high population density and compactness can allow for economies of scale and collaboration. So you've got challenge and opportunity in a sentence like that, that I think really encapsulates what we're trying to do with cities around the world right now. But interestingly, of course, in a sentence like that, culture is not mentioned. There's a list of stuff there, congestion, waste, education, crime, pick an essay, pick a city policy, they cover all of those things. And much of the major discourse in cities is the same. Those dominant themes are always sustainability in every sense, crime, crime and safety, health and well-being, and that dominant god of all things, capitalism and the economy. But in an audience like this, I'm certain that everyone is immediately thinking, there's been lots of discourse about the centrality of culture in cities. In the 90s, we called it culturally-led regeneration, fueled by capital money from the, new, the then new national lottery. And we've seen many iterations of this roll out over subsequent decades. In fact, a lot of current and imminent cultural policy discourse is once again, the circularity of these things, embracing the power of placemaking as one of its key drivers. And this probably, I think, comes in three flavours at the moment. So what's the first flavour? It's not raspberry, I'm afraid. Um, but it's this thing about years of, or capitals of, so we think of Hull and we think, of course, of Coventry in 21, or we think of Liverpool in 08, or, of course, this year's European capital of culture. No? 
Valletta in Malta. No. <laughs> yep. By giving a city the title, it creates a more intense gaze upon it from the public, from the politicians, the commercial sector and the outside world. It's also usually a way of wrapping up a bundle of resource that impacts on the, on the culture, on the business of culture making. Right now, it seems that every city wants to be a city of something. Second flavour is around signature or iconic buildings and institutions. So, you know, we might think of those early examples like Sage in Gateshead, or we might think of the one that's used endlessly, Guggenheim in Bilbao, or actually this phenomena that rolls out now across the world, and in a rather scathing article in the Financial Times earlier this year, a kind of copycat, privately funded, typically art gallery institution, popping up in many cities around the world, to such an extent that we can now consider them to be in danger of suffering the same status as our high streets, bland replicas of everywhere else. The third flavour is this emerging trend towards community-led initiatives. Of course, things like Creative People and Places or the recently published 64 Million Artists piece of work. And this returns us to the potent concepts of cultural democracy. And I choose to understand that, at least a little bit, through a kind of revisiting of punk rock and the DIY aesthetic. So there's three flavours there to chew on for a moment. So this idea that I began to suggest there is not a discourse about culture and cities is clearly wrong, isn't it? But actually it's not quite my point. If I put on my practitioner head for a moment, and I spent a lot of my career attending meetings that are not primarily about culture, but are primarily about some sort of wider place agenda, and I can absolutely assure you, yeah, this is my week in, week out experience, that culture is almost never a first order issue in those discussions. And more importantly, that shouting that it should be is not enough. And against the current backdrop of provision, the current business models of the sector, the current leadership style of the sector, and indeed the whole tone of the way that we present ourselves, I don't think it's going to be good enough. In fact, I think we're in a period of diminishing returns on this. So at this point, now that I've mentioned a few cities, and, and I've said that my predominant context is going to be the UK, that doesn't stop us all suffering from this new professional malaise in both the city's context and the cultural context, city envy. Yeah? Whereby with little evidence usually, but with lots of hope, we grab an idea from elsewhere, usually on one of those weekend visits that you've just done, as if it's clearly the solution and panacea for our own challenges. This means, for example, that we love the European model where a particular kind of cultural provision is still largely owned and funded by local government. And we quickly forget that the creativity, autonomy and accountability of our own system may bring other benefits. Or if someone mentions a mayor, we mistakenly assume that they have the same overriding powers as the United States mayors that we so love in Netflix dramas. And we forget that the range of powers that the mayors have varies enormously from Chicago to Sao Paulo, from London to Mumbai, or indeed from combined authorities. So what has been happening in cultural policy making over the last 20 years plus? I feel like I need to breathe, you all need to breathe. Um, so 20 years uh, of cultural policy making, I'm going to kind of reflect on. I've got some incredibly wonderful intelligent colleagues in this audience, so you can correct me afterwards. Right? But I reckon there are, give or take, five major things that have just keep on coming and coming at us through cultural policy over that period. Yep. Um, and again, this is my experience as a practitioner. Um, and, you know, there has always been a bunch of dynamics around this stuff but I'm going to try and say why I think they continue to fascinate and perplex me in equal measure. But let me start with, if I may, a small story about me. Um, if you start your career, as I did, in a curatorial role, a visual arts role, in a public sector museums and galleries environment, you very quickly pick up the disposition of the sector. So I started writing catalogues, 
I started doing the private views, I did the studio visits, visits and I put on exhibitions that the public did or didn't bother to come to. Yeah. Um, so early in my career, when I was thrilled to go to a gallery called the Cleveland Gallery in a place called Teesside, Middlesbrough, Hartlepool and Stockton, uh, in the early 90s with my young family, um, I got there and although the gallery is long gone, you will now know it as Middlesbrough Institute for Modern Art. Yeah. And so I ran one of the precursor galleries for that, the collection transferred across. Now, you cannot arrive in Middlesbrough, or, my, or more widely Teesside, in the early 90s and not be overwhelmed, literally overwhelmed, by the context of place. One of the world's largest chemical plants, yeah. decades of economic and social deprivation, this fascinating social and political context, and actually at the time, a now largely forgotten titanic struggle for the reorganisation of local government. Um, and, um, and I guess that still goes on, doesn't it? In those early weeks in the job, I suffered what I describe as acute vertigo. Running a cultural institution was based on uh, the, running a cultural institution that made very little sense to me. I was captivated and genuinely dismayed in equal measure. In fact, um, I spent six lively and curious years in Teesside, in both Middlesbrough and Hartlepool, and it ended up being a deep privilege. And I should encourage you um, to take a moment to have a look at Teesside. So, uh, as I was thinking about doing this talk, I was reminded, in that way that we all do, of a kind of um, uh, nostalgia and deep memory and a set of images that take me back to that place. And there's an absolutely wonderful photographer called Ian MacDonald. And um, I had the privilege of working with Ian when I was there uh, and hadn't had contact with him for 20 years. And I suddenly thought, you know, um, because hopefully you're pleased I'm not doing a PowerPoint presentation, um, I suddenly thought, well, maybe I ought to put something behind him. Wouldn't it be lovely to put some of Ian's work up? So I dug him out, dropped him a note, actually just at the end of the last week, and said, look, Ian, I'm really sorry to ask, and, um, but is there any chance I could use a couple of your images just as a backdrop? Because his images are clearly much more interesting than me. Um, Ian's had the privilege of being included in uh, Royal Academy shows of the 100 best photographs of all time. Um, but he's been a photographer that has entirely based his analogue, still analogue practice um, in Teesside, documenting that place. So uh, he very kindly yesterday sent me six images and just as I talk I'm just going to show you those six images. Um, because they do something, I think, astonishing, these images. Uh, and no, I'm not in that one. Yeah. So. Moving to Teesside early in my career was genuinely a collision, genuinely a collision moment for me. This place where a fraught and curious mixture of people, place, economics, politics and communities began to have some real purchase on my professional practice and curiosity. In many ways it kind of created a disorientation that I've never wanted to fully reconcile or understand. And this small privilege, I'm um, sorry, this large privilege in the small way I'm doing it of this professorship just allows me a few minutes to explore it with you. And how does this fit in with this 25 years or so of cultural policy making and the concurrent practice that goes with it? So let me take you back now to this notion of what I think are these predominant cultural policy making paradigms that keep coming up. So I mentioned, of course, earlier culturally led regeneration. And we've called it lots of other things since, but this new influx of resources for the National Lottery that fired up the rebuilding of our sector's capital infrastructure. And once the money escaped the clutches of London and the South East, of course we did see the Newcastle Gateshead Quayside come to life. And my own equivalent um, in Hartlepool, where I built a new museum and a new art gallery. And the almost relocation to Hartlepool of the Imperial War Museum now located, as you'll know, in Manchester. The proposed Hartlepool building was designed by Norman Foster. The Teesside Development Corporation, and I'll come back to them later, um, offered £14 million towards the project, but state aid stopped it. 
And, and for a while, actually, and they're gone now, if you drove into Hartlepool, you would still see the signs to the Imperial War Museum that never got built. Um, and in this little story, I think we see this compulsion towards the Grand Projet. Yeah? The notion that cities and culture are about big buildings and big institutions. And I think that still reverberates today. And we see that in the city competitiveness that's behind it. And we see it, see it still in this kind of uh, macro-political argument that things have to be pushed out of the economy of London and the South East elsewhere. And we see it, of course, in Channel 4's decision last week. And really, there's a set of circumstances that allowed this to happen because it coincided yeah, with the hollowing out of city centres and the great inversion, as it's now known by urban policymakers, whereby the middle classes previously pushed out into the suburbs come back and occupy our city centres. And having that new and refreshed capital infrastructure seemed to fit with that model. So money, circumstance, city inversion, you bring that around. So there's a first thing that I think we haven't lost in cultural policy making. What are our institutions? Second one, cultural and creative industries. Um, and it's very interesting. Um, I had the pleasure of getting to know Chris Smith when he was Secretary of State quite well. And he really started this movement as the DCMS minister um, under Blair's administration in the late 90s. And he caught hold of a predominant government narrative, and I think it's one that still defines the new Labour government. I think we still wrestle with it, actually, um, but it was a massive push towards describing, capturing, enshrining, and in every other way trying to exploit what we know as the economic development agenda. So we see that first DCMS report, or baseline studies as they were they known. I don't know what they're called that anymore. Baseline studies as they were known. And I was part of the one in Yorkshire, the cultural industries baseline study. We now call it a creative industries one because the language keeps shifting. Um, uh, and I can confess that in my context of my early enthusiasm for this approach, I told you there were a couple of things I told you were going to make me tired. Yeah? Um, I confess that my early enthusiasm for this approach now dips in energy level when it raises its head week by week across my work, across all the cities I've worked and all the contexts. Um, and I'll come back to it a little bit more uh, as I talk about this notion of capitalism and, and um, proving economic value. But there is something in it that stayed strong in cultural policy about our thinking that we have to keep defining our economic value alongside our cultural value in some way. So that predominant driver has been prove economic value and everything will follow from that. It's been one of those kind of prove that and everything else will sort itself out. It's become a cornerstone of every city's push. Yep. How do we become economically successful? And it's interesting that, because if cities are the engine and consequence of capitalism and economic growth, how do we locate culture in that thing? There's a whole other lecture, it would be great fun to do it, um, of course that capitalism trickle-down doesn't work, yeah? that Picardy and all of those great economic thinkers of our time are saying this stuff doesn't make sense anymore, but somehow or other I think we've been shy to let go in the cultural sector. So I'm not convinced that tying our cultural arguments to a rigorously current economic, that pol economic policy paradigm is quite the solution that we once hoped it would be. More, pointed, more pointedly, I think there is a debate to be had about whether it at times actually undermines the amazing thing that the cultural world brings to us ethically and morally. Yeah? That notion of urgent. Yeah? To promote empathy and curiosity, wonder and wondering and more. If new and different economic models, and let's hope they are, are going to come to the fruition, are going to drive the great cities of the future, shouldn't we be the engines of putting culture at the heart of them? So in practice, and I love this, you know, it tends to play out like this in the political arena. With every arts minister I've met and every local politician I encounter, it takes almost seconds and occasionally minutes yeah, for them to say, give me the evidence and I'll take it to Treasury. Yeah? Give me the evidence and I'll take it to Treasury, as if in some way that will lead to the outcome that we're looking for. And of course, I'm not arguing it's completely wrong. It simply can't be enough. 
And as our arguments for the creative industries st have stretched out their tentacles uh, uh, across digital, across create tech, across fintech, and across everything else that we agglomerate them into, like a corporation, yeah, providing 100 billion or whatever number comes up this week of value to the UK economy, we run the risk of, um, of diminishing, it seems to me, something so important. Or to just shrink our arguments on the other side about something, and this is a new phrase to me in the last couple of months in cultural policy, publicly funded culture. Yep, that feels like a dangerous term, publicly funded culture, to me. Um, with an uncomfortably close alignment that it seems to me goes with it to a handful of institutions that traditionally sit in our urban centres. And I feel challenged about how to navigate that in each circumstance to best effect. I worry actually that we may have created a monster with the creative and cultural industries debate. But in the hunger for irrefutable economic impact evidence, let me share this with you. And it comes from a beautiful book called Wilding that I just read. Um, dung beetles, dung beetles, yeah. They're pretty much being wiped out globally by pesticides and insecticides, yeah. But in fact, if you reintroduce dung beetles back into the agricultural economy, you can do some wonderful things to the quality and ecosystem of our soil. And of course, as a result of that, somebody did an economic impact study on dung beetles and um, came out at about 500 million pounds to the UK economy. Um, so whilst I can't, I'm not, sorry, whilst you'll be clear, let me be very clear, I'm amazingly supportive of the importance of dung beetles, genuinely, I'll come back to it. Um, but I'm uncomfortable that the advocacy for them seems to rely once again on this mythical impact, uh, economic impact analysis. Third flavour. Creative partnerships, education, creativity in the curriculum. And I really don't have time to explore this fully this morning, but cultural policy is tenaciously held on to the role that it plays in education and creativity. And we typically have seen wave after wave of constructive, exciting, positive interactions and projects from the cultural sector side, but frankly, very little systemic change on the education policy side. Which is, to say that, which is not to say, of course, that there hasn't been enormous shifts in the structure and the way that the education uh, in our country works, um, and there's been so much change that you hear about that constant fatigue in the sector around that, but actually a fundamental relationship with cultural policy remains elusive. We see survey after survey, literally every week, that indicates that creativity is a vital skill for our future workforce just as we see it remain a stubborn sub-priority for our schools. In the context of city building, however, the education sector continues to sit front and centre as a key engine of social and economic and community change. We might see this close, but I think not quite close enough relationship between schools, education, culture and the future of cities as an example of territory that needs exploring better. We know that the relationship between successful cities and skills and their populations is a cornerstone, not just of economic success, but almost every other of marker um, of, uh, of success in cities, well-being, quality of life, happiness, all of those things. I might be suggesting here that the limitations that we put around our current cultural policy making, mirrored with those that define our education and skills policies, constrain the full flowering of both. Fourth area, diversity, participation and audiences. Oh gosh, this is an ever-present in cultural policy making. And do you know what? It's an ever-present because re the reality is there's been a stubborn failure to really address it and move it on. I hope that I'm far enough into these few words, i.e. that I've given you some sense of where I stand in the addressing some of these things, for you to understand that I think the current paradigms of both dominant city-making policies and decision-making, and the way that current cultural policy interacts with those, are in current constant danger of ossifying the status quo rather than liberating the genius of place. So 
I really cannot this evening address the full seriousness and complexity of this debate, but I'd like to draw out a couple of thoughts and share them with you. It's largely true that the global shift towards cities is characterised by diversity and migration. So our actual cities are being made by this process. It's a fundamental part of contemporary placemaking in cities across the world. And if we make this simple corollary across from this to the business, the act of creativity and cultural expression, as I said earlier, that ineluctable thing that is us, um, uh, the human condition, then how can, then we can rapidly see that we have a, a highly dynamic engine of positive city change matching a systemic change in cultural policy making that if given the real oxygen required could unleash transformational change in every area of city life. Yet somehow we still have a dominant approach across many city inclusion strategies that is driven by a deficit model that in some way we have a problem to solve rather than an asset-based celebration model um, that really uh, liberates so much. So this deep relationship in all city metrics between skills, economic success, health and well-being outcomes and more can still draw some startling city maps when overlaid with these population demographics. How we rethink and reframe po cultural policy not to provide inroads into these maps but to create and unleash the energy or out of them but to create and unleash the energy that comes out of them feels urgent, it feels exhilarating and game-changing for both city-making and culture-making. Um, I think there's an overwhelming opportunity in that space that we're not taking. Final one, resilience. Um, and this has really come out ever since 2008, so it's aligned very highly to the last decade of austerity and financial crash. So, um, and it's become very omnipresent in cultural policy-making. And in cultural terms, it's usually applied to the financial and commercial, commercial models of the existing stock, the existing stock of cultural institutions. It's become about income diversification, asset ownership, city envy comes in here around the predominance of philanthropic and corporate giving in other countries, and occasionally explores and parallel, parallels the financial resilience and models of other sectors, other industrial sectors, like manufacturing or bioscience, digital and all of those things. It can sometimes seem that the business models of culture sit entirely outside the major systems of finance in cities. At its simplest, debt, loan or equity finance is barely a footnote in cultural policy making. Yet it fuels every other sector as a matter of embedded normality. Whether that's right or wrong, and we've talked about capitalism, is another issue. But as, as a point of difference between the financial resilience in the economies of cities and that of the sector, it seems to me there is still lots of room to explore. And in fact, in city making, um, the term resilience is usually about the wider concept of the ability of a place to resist shocks floods, power outages, transport disruptions. And programmes such as the 100 Resilient Cities or the Global City Lab projects explore complex systemic approaches to the way that we design, activate and make our cities. Sometimes they even dare to think outside of the current paradigms. Sometimes they even dare to think outside of the current paradigms and suggest alternative futures. Are you ready for another Ian MacDonald? Um, a good example of thinking outside of the paradigm might be the upstream rewilding of our waterways rather than the downstream building of concrete flood dis uh, defences. Um, and actually there's a lovely North Yorkshire example I read about the other day whereby they were about to build 20 million pounds worth of concrete flood defences and the community said we don't want them. Yeah. And they came up with an alternative plan around rewilding and putting nature back into their waterways cost £2 million. They managed to do it and it's worked fantastically well. It's a lovely little example for me of just how we need to turn our minds yep, um, to do things differently. Of course, that um, approach 
to flood defences, works much better, costs much less, and brings all of those extraordinary associated benefits. And this kind of practice makes sense on every level of resilience. And I think we need more space in the cultural policies place to explore these alternative futures. Now, if that's the five presets, and we do a quick fly-through of the um, city thing, uh, the equivalent policy-making in cities, I caught the clock then, so I'm going to speed up. Yeah. Um, we find that actually city uh, strategies around the world are addressing this notion of a need for a new kind of economics because the current one is leading to this notion of widening disparities that we're all so familiar with, the 1% getting richer. And we know that actually all of those policies are not, despite phrases like good growth and inclusive growth, that's becoming really dominant at the moment, yeah? changing the paradigm. So we have copycat cities as a result of globalism. We have the rise of the coffee shop, coffee shop and its emblematic new economy of the coffee bean, as both new urban hipster and actually Costa. Uh, we also have this thing of city centre gentrification and living, the over-demand and under-resourcing of public services for health, peak oil, and the end of the car as a means of personal transport. Virtually every manifestation of environmental disintegration from species decline to air quality, poor diet, obesity, and so on. These are the giant concerns of our time. These are the issues that cities are addressing. And whilst where they confront us and disorientate us, um, and sometimes we try to place culture in a kind of David versus Goliath piece of work in their midst. Now, this powerful list of challenges has been a constant wave of new public agencies created and deconstructed in order to make progress. Economic development agencies have moved from development corporations, like the one we had in Hartlepool, to powerful regional development agencies, the RDAs, to the current LEP structures. And we know there have been ERDF and ESF funds, single regeneration budgets, local growth funds, dozens of iterations in between. We've had every raft of youth and employment agencies, the complete redesign of the HE sector with student fees and the subsequent re-emergence of universities as major anchor institutions. The implementation of a staggeringly complex health system. Who exactly does commission who in our health system these days? <laughs> yeah. um, and of course, all the way through that, we've got local government and municipalism. Um, with all of its powers, resources, freedoms and flexibilities diminished, subject to constant change and um, now a decade of austerity that I think we all know has just ended. <laughs> um, so in there, my journey, cultural policy, cities. So we live and work and practice, I think, in a literal storm of policy making. And we shovel evidence empiricism and statistical insight into these policies as if it's irrefutable yeah and as if it must be the energy of common sense and a proof of concept all of that's driven by this wonderful government green book you know this thing that apparently says how we spend public m money with sense but it doesn't entirely seem to be working or i might argue that it only works to a certain extent so it makes things less work, less worse than if it wasn't there, rather than actually being the thing that I think sometimes we mistake it for, that genuinely leads and drives us forward to a better place. When we look at this across a couple of decades, we see that we are still wrestling with the same thing. Skills gaps and inequalities, youth unemployment, housing shortages, air quality, and the catastrophic decline of the insect population. If all of this in some way has just become the new normal for us, or a natural consequence of changing politics at local and global level, it also has a set of corollary consequences when it is scanned in parallel to the cultural policy I've outlined. If nothing else, I think, it runs the real danger of making cultural policy making seem rather small and diminutive uh, a little second tier, actually, and slightly reductive, maybe even stuck in comparison to big city policy making. So in this era of fast-moving city contexts and the ageing population, the clean air, community safety, economic disparity are stark and urgent challenges, then the solutions surely need to be radical, not incremental. <laughs> 
And whilst we might be beginning to get comfortable in some places with the arguments for new transport systems that are redesigned away from the car, or new kinds of health infrastructure, or of course the transition from fossil fuels to green energy, or to the end of commercial monopolies in our supermarket food chains, I think we're beginning to see some of that emerge in cities that we probably look to with city envy around the place. It's probably not happening with the velocity that we actually need it to. I still think, even though all of that, we may be slightly more reticent about a complete redesign and reconceptualizing of our cultural infrastructure. Maybe it's not that it's a complete redesign that's need, um, but the actuality of the sector, uh, sorry, it's not a complete redesign of the actuality of the sector, but a more um, more nuanced reconceptualizing of this discord between the established notion of what publicly funded culture is and the too broad definition that has become the creative industries. So if I try to think of a little thing that sits in the space there, you might think about music, you might think about grime or reggae or punk or jazz or pick an era. And it seems to me that that kind of culture sits in a lovely sweet spot. These are all art forms that sit at the interface between culture and cities. They have become cultural practice because of their place, their geography, their economic reality and their social circumstances. Think about where they've all come from. And I can't absolutely prove this, but I don't think the success of any of those forms of music had much to do with cultural policy making. Um, or indeed fu public funding, but I, I suspect that many of them were an unintended consequence of the other city making propositions and policy making. So instead we in the cultural sector seem to prefer to do this, we load up our current cultural infrastructure with new demands to do more education, to be more commercial, to drive the economy harder. Um, and uh, it seems to me that we forget in that place that actually the demise of British home stores, which we may or may not um, lament, or post offices or banks on our high streets, um, are a direct correlation to the same challenges that our predominant cultural institutions of course are facing. And it must be that the changing nature of our cities has an effect on the changing nature of our understanding of cultural infrastructure. But what am I really picking away at here? It seems to me there is a dilemma of addressing cultural policy within the challenges of the future of the city. And by the way, when we talk about the future of the city, that's not some sort of sci-fi reality out there. That's today and tomorrow and what we do now. Um, we run the risk of doing the same thing that we do with climate change and sort of rationalizing it away into the future rather than treating it as urgent and now. So we recline yeah, um, in policy make, cultural policy making to, to Victorian. Uh, and to a Victorian approach to city making. What might I think by that? That sewers and water supply, great things were invented by the Victorians. And our fundamental city geographies and housing typologies were, or our sense of a working week being nine to five on a Monday to Friday. And these are all um, examples of a Victorian constraint under which we're still operating. But it also turns out in this lovely stuff that actually our idea of what a ghost is, is entirely Victorian concept. You know, they float and they've got white robes on them. Yeah? Um, or indeed our Christmas traditions or whatever. So I'm suggesting, or maybe I'm even worrying with you, that our predominant narrative as a sector has not moved as far as we need it to. Um, and it's not that it hasn't moved, it's just not far enough. Because remember, if we're suggesting that culture is as ineluctable um, as we first proposed, won't it actually survive just fine in a new future city space? Or are we, like a car manufacturer, reticent about the power of the bicycle and public transport to redraw the future urban mobility paradigm, um, or indeed Uber or taxis, or Amazon and bookshops, or organic food production rather than intensive farming, or microenergy production rather than fossil fuels, pick an issue of a future city that appeals or not, and ask ourselves where we are in cultural policy making on that journey. Where might we look for a little bit of evidence of this? And it's that actually city cultural strategies 
um, in all Western democracies are becoming startlingly similar. They basically say a version of the five things that I've shared with you. So whether that's this city's or Chicago's, Manchester's, out to consultation at the moment, Manchester's, Glasgow's or whatever, they all say the same kind of stuff. It seems that not only our high streets have become homogenised and copycat. So what we typically see in a city environment is an ever more complex set of policies yeah, and data being drafted, adopted, disbanded, ignored and overlapped. And in any city environment there will be dozens and dozens of these policies. And one of those policies is likely to be called a cultural strategy. Several other of those policies might refer to the cultural sector as an enabler in some kind of way. And then, of course, the other thing that happens with strategies, um, particularly those driven out by government, is that we feel at um, any given moment a need for an overarching strategy. Yeah? A place where actually all of those other strategies are in some way dominated by something else. I could have said right now that that would be the government, current government's industrial strategy. But it seems to me that the 585 page document that got revealed last week might in fact be the dominant strategy at the moment. Um, so let me just share with you some thinking about something that might be an antidote to some of this and some thinking that I think is fascinating and we should talk about more in other spaces around city distinctiveness. Yeah. So one of the ways that this discussion about future cities has begun to be addressed is through this distinctiveness debate. And I think this has real merit as a starting point for future cultural policy and city making. So several times I've referred to this notion of bland copycat cities. So distinctiveness is the antidote for it. It goes to me to the heart of the challenge of globalisation to the constant real world and digital world environments that harry all of us into ever more sophisticated ways to channel our desires, our purchasing habits, our lifestyle expectations in particular ways. And how we might use really the power of the cultural voice to be this distinctive differentiator. It can unlock the potential of place and it seems to me the potential of culture, cities and place. So there's a lovely phrase, and there's lots of versions of this in city thinking, um, in progressive city thinking at the moment. But let me explain um, uh, through this quote why I think it's important. Capital, as in capitalism, is footloose in the global economy. Natural resources, highway access, locations along a river or a rail line have all become less important. Education, technology, connectivity and distinctiveness have all become more important. So an economist uh, called Joseph Courtright um, uh, makes this uh, comment. The unique characteristics of place may be the only true defensible source of competitive advantage for communities and cities. And of course Richard Florida in The Rise of the Creative Class says how people think of a place is less tangible, but more important than just about anything else. So if you're going to get into this notion of distinctiveness, there's a kind of quick set of warnings that, that my practice tells me we mustn't follow yeah, in our cultural policy making. There's a great tendency to say, let's get a bunch of leaders together in a city and try and find what's authentic about it. Yeah? And very quickly, they try to refer to its industrial past or something and say, that's why we're different. Yeah? And it immediately, I think, becomes reductive. And in doing that, they then say, well, let's sloganise that yeah, in some way. Yeah? Um, Glasgow smiles better. That one never leaves us, does it? Yeah? Um, or the love New York thing. Yeah? And whilst we might joke these days in city-making circles that we don't use that stuff anymore, I still think it sneaks in there. Um, and if we can't find one that is bottom-up, because that's not our approach to city-making, because city-making is always addressed top-down, then actually um, we just make one up. That's it. So it's amazing how many cities around the world have kind of come up with a slogan. And of course it lacks this real authenticity that must be a characteristic of distinctiveness. And if we don't make it genuine, then we actually don't create this meeting point between the genius of cultural expression and the genius of place. 
So I think the approach that we need to distinctiveness has to be much more open. It has to be grassroots. It has to refer again to this notion of how people make cities and how our communities have to be drivers of it, how we have to have a broad funnel of distinctiveness, not a rush towards narrow definitions and slogans, and to promote an approach to distinctiveness that really values that term. Any other approach to distinctiveness um, will quickly see it become commodified and devalued. It, mu it must utilise the entire capacities of communities in a free-moving, fluid and shifted way, shifting way, a kind of distinctive agility must drive our cultural policy making. And if we address both cultural and city policy making from this place, we may end up with something that feels really distinctive. It's a kind of whole system capture approach. And there are signs that some of this is beginning to happen. And we see it emerging things like participatory budgeting. Some of the South American cities are doing this or that stalled localism agenda that kicked around for a while, or these ideas of community-led regeneration. And in the cultural sector, we do see it in the, cultural, in the Creative People and Places programme. But we also need to remind ourselves that in Paris, they have moved away from a grand projet approach to cultural policy making. And they now address that through a much broader community engagement programme. And in fact, interestingly, New York's cultural strategy pushed in the same direction last year and said we have to lose some of these paradigms and find distinctiveness in our communities to drive a different narrative. Um, I think it's enormously challenging and deeply relational to all of our underlying and irrefutable love affair with culture um, that we must explore this with a truly rebellious, game-changing and shifting approach to culture making and city distinctiveness. Um, we use the rhetoric in the cultural sector of risk far more than we exhibit it. Yeah. So maybe if we really place risk-taking and disruptive practice at the heart of cultural policy making, we might see a corollary distinctiveness and we might find ourselves living in a wonderful world of culture in even more extraordinary cities. So it will allow this notion of uh, distinctiveness to really guide our practice in cultural policy making. So as we begin to draw to a close, uh, I'd like to spend a few, very few minutes um, to see whether or not we've got an understanding of cultural practice. Um, and I'm going to refer to a piece of work that has also dominated cultural policy making over the last few years. It's an understanding introduced to us by John Holden that in some way cultural practice is an ecology. So our cities have lots of cultural and creativity and they create an ecology. Uh, and, you know, just channel Attenborough for a moment. Yeah on all of your ecology um, understanding. And many of you may know that ecology is another great interest of mine. But actually what I love about it is that it's a practice, sometimes called a science, that keeps learning new things about the way that one part of a system interacts with another. And I think it promotes a kind of fearlessness that if you create the opportunities for a ecological system to thrive, it generally will find a way of doing it. It's a system that's based in um, species terms on interdependency, on trust and mutuality, and on the notion that thriving is what will happen. However, if you over-engineer a system, a natural world, by taking an anthropomorphic view of natural systems. And there is so much evidence in the world of ecological theory right now that we still unavoidably start to try to repair systems with a misunderstanding of their fundamentals and by putting a bit of human interaction in yeah, that goes wrong rather than letting the process come up another way.
that, um, that if we put too much regulation or through false assumptions about interrelations in an ecological sense, then we can create a kind of denuded or thin version of nature. And you'll see that I'm drawing this parallel with what I think is the real potential richness of the ecology of our cultural sector in a city. We might think about these lovely stories over the last few years where they've reintroduced wolves and bears as top predators into ecosystems that had lost them. And week after week, what they find is that those reintroduction of those top predators gives them benefits that they simply couldn't predict. And the complexity and set of interactions of those top predators, bears and wolves, has actually radically transformed massive landscapes back to a better, healthy state. I'm going to begin to leave you now with the thought about what are the bears and wolves that we need to introduce into the cultural sector in order to create that same ecological transformation. Now finally, another report on cities says, cities are becoming more spatially fragmented, more socially divisive and more environmentally destructive. And I'm really suggesting that cultural practice must put itself into the front line of addressing these issues. So not second tier, front tier. How do we become on the front foot of city making? And we move ourselves into uh, a space where we're making a compelling case for becoming a first order sector for progressive city change. Now we know, don't we, that 90% of Reykjavik's heating comes from geothermal renewable energy. I suspect actually almost none of Birmingham's does. I never checked that actually, but it's an interesting idea. Or we know, don't we, that the citizens of Copenhagen's pr predominant form of transport is the bicycle. We know that the world's largest megacity, Tokyo, is also the place by a bunch of city metrics um, that comes out as the most creative city in the world. So what we might begin to understand with these metrics, and let's remind ourselves, city metrics are just a form of storytelling, yeah? Is that cities that break or lead the dominant norm also carry with them, it appears, a much wider set of successes for livability, for destinations, as symbols of hope, hope for humanity, and of course for the ever-present GDP, GVA, capitalism. But I think there's something really curious and powerful in here, something that outstrips the current cultural and city narrative in new ways. And it must be about systemic or complexity system change. If our habitual, habitual practice is to misunderstand cultural policy as, as a way of contributing to existing city drivers, let me say that again, if we misunderstand the, the current way that we do cultural policy is simply trying to catch up with what have proven to be a set of flawed city-making policies, then it seems to me that we cap our own potential as a sector. We put a glass ceiling on it. And we actually continue to stand in the room next door to where the real decisions are being made. And you'll understand here, this is nothing to do with arguing or not for current public funding for the arts or for scraps off of the economical regeneration table but to suggest that fundamentally a more imaginative way of reframing the shape of the sector and its capability to lead a new kind of cultural systems narrative um, is the way that we will avoid the risk of underplaying this amazing thing that our cultural selves, our creative expression is. And that if we can find those ways, and this is all that a, culture, that a policy process is, so a, it's a way, yeah? a way of describing an approach or telling a story or suggesting a route map that can unleash the whole potential system for culture in cities and not just the system that we have come to understand and habituate in our cultural policy, then I think we can unleash, unleash or unhinge yep, and contribute to a far better notion of city making. In this sense, we might understand that the future of our cities um, is our great opportunity for cultural expression.
Thank you very much.